Welcome back to the Gnome Show, everyone. I am Josh, your humble host, and it is my duty, nay, my pleasure, to trawl the briny depths of YouTube so that I may bring you the shinies. I cover short films of varying genres, video games, analog horror and sci-fi, and anything else that I think is groovy. Hope you'll enjoy tonight's offerings. Content for the blood god. <clears throat> I mean, on with the show. Tonight we have uh, Why the Crow Remains a Timeless Classic. And yeah, it is a timeless motherfucking classic. Uh, the, it's, it's, it's fucking Brandon Lee. And, and, and it's fucking, uh, it's the crow. I mean, what else do you need? Um, if you haven't seen it, um, let this be your fair warning on um, spoilers. Um, but uh, let's be honest, this movie is from 94. So uh, if you haven't seen it, gets the fucking cracking. That out of the way. Let's see what Joe Blow has to say about the issue. And hey, hey, there we are. Uh, we know these guys. We know these guys right here. Uh, yeah. All right. The Crow may be one of the greatest examples of catching the lightning in a bottle. It's a movie that is so tied that to its time tonight. period that its execution, poetically <clears throat> unique, becomes timeless. Of course, the general idea of The Crow isn't special, an unjust death, avenging the loss of a loved one, and setting the wrong things right. But the reinterpretation of uh, literary tropes mixed with a 90s alternative scene and, well, as the idiom that Iggy Pop once wrote in the reissue of Rob Power goes, the proof is in the pudding. Mm -hmm. And here we are, 30 plus years later, still discussing how good it still is. But as always, I want to ask, what is the scene that defines it? What makes the crow so distinctive? Well, let's rock and roll. I'm Lance Velchek. Amen. This is Scene Breakdown. Directed by Alex Proyas and written by John Shirley. Re yeah, James O'Barr is the uh, the creator of um, The Crow. Um, the comic book itself is kind of uh, like on its own rails. So don't expect the movie to entirely match up with anything that's in the graphic novel or the comics. Uh, but... <clears throat> in my opinion, as a movie distillation of uh, what The Crow is, this is it. And this is probably the best we'll ever get on film. Writes by David Shaw and adapted from James O'Barr's graphic novel, a movie marred with tragedy yet celebrated for its respect of Brandon Lee's legacy. Why does The Crow work? Why are we still talking about it this many years later? Normally, I'd break it down with the defining scene, the one that represents the movie best. But with something <coughs> like The Crow, it just... <coughs> Sorry, the Nick hit me wrong. So I would say this scene right here is probably one of the defining scenes um it is one of the things that's on the soundtrack where he plays uh, a guitar on the rooftops um uh, another one is um uh when he uh, makes the uh, the raven sign uh on the ground um uh in in and uh i mean there are a number of them um the one uh in the uh the scene in the window in the uh the picture window where he's in shadow and he's uh telling um Shelly that it can't rain or not Shelly but the uh, the little girl that it can't rain all the time 
Um, uh, the the one in the pawn shop, uh, where like uh, he shoots the rings at the fucking dude and fucking blows up the pawn shop. Um, uh, when he fucking sends uh, the two off the fucking pier, like uh, in an explosion, uh, like uh, when he's fighting the dude at the end and he's like on the uh, on the top of the church and they're fighting and he fucking uh, uh, what is it? The, the dude gets stabbed or like gets you know like impaled onto the fucking church. There, there's all kinds of fucking scenes. Um, I don't know. I guess we'll, we'll we'll find out what he thinks is the um the the most uh, defining scene. Uh, maybe there isn't one. I mean, because I would say the movie is defining, like in like in entirety, like uh like the the sum of its parts make it uh. It's not just the sum of its parts, but the the unique sum the unique parts that make it you know, like, it, make it what it is, um, you know, let's see. This wouldn't be fair. This works on a lot of different levels. Storytelling, right. visual flair, soundtrack, world yeah. building. Would just one scene work here? No, I wouldn't. No, so it wouldn't. It. I'm doing three. Hell yeah! Let's boogie! Yeah! The pawn shop! Gideon's pawn shop does so much with so little pointed yet grounded dialogue, fantastic blocking, and some iconic imagery. This is where we really meet Eric Draven. Yes, After it is. After the mad dog approach of offing Tintin, <laughs> Eric yeah, heads again. That was a good one, too. Walking through the glass door, quoting Edgar Allan Poe. I heard a tap as of someone gently rapping. The opening conversation shows us Eric's sense of humor and Brandon Lee's approach to the character. I don't think we really talk about how playful and charming Brandon with the character of Eric really is. Listen to how he tells Gideon that his attempts of defending himself are futile. Mr. Gideon, who? I'm not paying attention. Who then, skillfully and with ease, knife his hand to the counter. It's here we first get to see the balance of the character. I love that the fact that Eric's first stop, once he's suited up, is to retrieve his wedding ring. Eric feeling for his ring had some heart. Sticking yeah. to the love conquers all theme. Yeah. Wow, also just kind of tossing every other non-important wedding ring. <laughs> I mean, you know, I gotta respect the balance. Plus, let's right. not forget. No, and no, let's give no, too. no. The always fantastic John Polito. I mean, I forgot about how fully committed yes. he plays Gideon. And that this slummy curmudgeon of a character may just get the best lines of the movie. And my business gets blown up real good. Other than that, my day sucked. I'll give you 50 bucks. I hate charities. Take your fucking rates out. Take your fucking rates out. You shoot them. And you choke on them. You son of a bitch. And everything comes to a close when Eric lets Gideon know he must not forget about the gasoline. And promptly blows it all to hell. Standing right in the middle of it, too. Michael Wincott plays top dollar with Fuck a yeah. surge. Bro, can we talk about this guy for a second? So, before he was anything else, this motherfucker was shit making a shit fucking bricks. This guy was fucking crazy. Absolutely fucking terrifying. Uh, which, um, like, um, made it a little bit um, of a letdown when he played in Aliens uh, 3. No, Aliens 4, Resurrection. Yes. That one. Um, the one in space. Um, that was fucking stupid to say. The one that, uh, the one that's uh, with the, um, the Ripley clones. He was in that one. Um, uh, like, I mean, it was good to see him, uh, but not nearly as menacing as this guy. This guy was, it's like, um... Um, that one dude that's the psycho in that one fucking game, uh, Far Cry, whatever, um, sort of, like, you could probably say this might be based, no, he might have some influence from, from this guy, um, but, uh, I don't know, that, that sort of absolutely fucking off his rocker that has full, complete fucking, like, cognitive, cognitive control, like, he just is crazy he's fully fucking capable he just is 
crazy. You know, that's fucking creepy. Precision of apathy over mm -hmm. indulgence and in charm. I mean, the dude might just have the coolest voice of all time. Mm -hmm. If bourbon and a cigar could become one and then sentient, it would sound like the great Michael Wincott. I think we ought to have an introspective moment of silence for poor. He was in, um, I think he was in um, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, I think. Roll tent. His speech at the end is another aspect that embodies why the crow works. This is a dark fairy tale filtered through the grungy and goth aesthetics, merged with the heart of the 90s. I mean, think about this. Uh, the king lets his men rape and pillage. A lowly peasant must face said king and avenge his princess. We get a sword fight finish at the top of a church. I mean, hell, top dollar is wearing period garb. Yes, and it Michael even Wayne ends Scott. with a kiss. But in this fairy tale, it's always raining. Everything is in urban decay. And problems are solved the old-fashioned way, with guns. By shooting anyone and everyone. Okay, so this scene opens with an overhead dolly shot showing the power and size of the villain and his henchmen. Skank is wounded and being held by top enforcer slash assassin, Grage, the great Mr. Tony Todd. As Top Dollar lays out his bait and show of strength for the silver. Right, Tony Todd's in this joint too. Greed is for amateurs. Disorder, chaos, anarchy. Now that's fun. I mean, if I'm being honest, that's it's a surprisingly fun. motivating and inspiring speech. You know, just set in the, the mind of a psychopathic tyrant. And then Eric walks in, I mean, with a swagger like no other, and his point blank delivery. I just want him. Well, you can have him. To then this become a Hong Kong shootout. Here is the ideal example of tone. It's right, both cool so yet believably bleak. Michael Wincott was in Nope, Veni, Vedi, Veni, Vidi, Vici, Ghost in the Shell, Westworld, Forsaken, Nye of Cups, Halo 2, Anniversary 24, Grand Street, The Girl from Nagasaki, Hitchcock, Darksiders 2, Infects, Syndicate, Farewell, A Lonely Place for Dying, Sketches from Great Goal. What just happened? The Divine Diving Bell on the Butterfly, uh, Halo 2, uh, Treasure Planet Reno. Okay, all right. Um, Red Phone Manhunt, Treasure Planet. Okay, uh, the video game and the movie. Okay, uh, County Monte Cristo. Um, let's see, Alien Resurrection, Metro, uh, Strange Days. Uh, the Crow, Three Musketeers, Romeo is Bleeding, uh, Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, uh, he's also in The Doors, uh, Born on the Fourth of July, um, Equalizer, oh really, and he was on the, uh, on the, on the TV series, okay, alright, well that was back in the day, um, wow, he was, dude, he's been on fucking everything, <laughs> alright. Yeah, so uh, the great Michael Wingard. Engaging and well-shot action. Plus, it shows how flawless the humor is executed throughout. The crow is constantly making me laugh, yet never, ever taking away from the severity of the situation. No, it's all gallows humor. And of course, we cannot leave out the creation of the crow persona. Now, this is where the tragedy needed skill and innovation to honor the legacy of Brandon Lee. Him entering the apartment is a really well done composite of Eric earlier in the alleyway. We get a lot of POV shots, shots from behind, and other tricks to cover the double's face. And as a scene, it's crucial. And this is the big sell of the movie. And this workaround doesn't take anything away narratively. In fact, it's one of the greatest scenes in the movie. This iconic shot uses a digital composite of Brandon's face over his stunt double. But let's look at the scene in terms of storytelling. Having Eric remember his life and overcome with intense, crippling emotion, creating the ego of Avenger through unfiltered anger is something that is nailed perfectly in this type of slightly off-kilter reality. Finding his healing powers in an over-the-top way to aggressively painting his face even taking a little time out of his day to pet the damn cat. And it's all scored to As the you tears should. burn. It's a genuinely beautiful scene. 
that's exaggerations fit soundly together in the grim yeah and it gives you a sort of surreal look like uh like everything being like filmed out of a fish and fish eye lens or out of the lens of a bird which in a lot of ways uh certain scenes are urban goth aesthetic it's the scene that establishes its cultural tone summing up the vibe in both sound and vision and of course the music in this movie is objectively perfect I know it has long had the credit of being a great movie soundtrack, but this is one of the very few times that it's blended into the fictional world so flawlessly. Of course, there are many other iconic moments here. The ending fight with Top Dollar, Eric using his grief and pain as the ultimate weapon. Right. And one that should have made this list is the sweet moment when Ernie Hudson's character yes. opens up to Eric. The one that ends with him going right the theatrics and just leaving like the rest of us. Are we gonna vanish into thin air again? I thought I'd use your front door. The Crow has always been a childhood memory for me. Hanging out at the aisles of the video store, hanging out at Family Video, renting this over and over. This one movie might have taught me about the power of world building through style. Look at that. Like, uh, like uh, just from one shot, you could tell the fucking city was absolutely... dying. It's lightning in a bottle in the most cinematic sense. Everything Absolutely. somehow worked, despite so much sadness. To make something this unique, tied to its era and unable to successfully reproduce, The Crow is lightning in a bottle. I mean, part two understood the world, but failed the characters. Number three had more focused intentions and kind of blended one and two, but didn't have the budget or intelligence to make anything but a low rent copy. And f the fourth movie. Well, In the definitely. end, The Crow has endured the changing of times because its story and message are timeless. Yeah. While the world in this story is a remembrance for when you could be weird with a decent budget and execute an actual vision, art is an important building block of life. And I'm glad to live in an era where I got to experience this story <coughs> firsthand. I miss the sentimental nature and creativity of this type of storytelling. And as I look back this many years later, I can tell it's something we all took for granted with 90s cinema. Straight face, you motherfucker! Is that gasoline I smell? Hell yeah. He tanked that explosion, bro. Like, absolutely tanked that explosion in front of Gideon's pawn shop. Like, that was fucking brutal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, 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 and... The the uh, the 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 last fight, like when he uh, when he breaks into uh, what's his face's uh, uh, gangster hideout and everything, and just like wipes everybody out in the fucking uh, uh, in in the boardroom. It's fantastic. If you haven't seen The Crow, which uh, I mean. If you're young, your parents should have showed you The Crow, or you should have found it by now uh, through Netflix, at least, or some other streaming service. You should have found it by now. Uh, but if somehow you haven't seen this movie, oh, by God, please go check it out. Um, yeah, this has been a rather succinct uh, uh, synopsis, synopsis of why the film is fucking is cranking, will always crank. Uh, and we'll be talking about this for another 25 years, 30 years into the future, maybe more, maybe forever, God willing. Um, this is by Joe Blow Horror uh, Originals. Um, go check them out. They've got tons of material. Um, and they get my, my, my nostalgia itch. Uh, it's why I usually watch their stuff. So, um, go give them some love, like subscribe and share everyone. Uh, be safe, be happy, be healthy. Uh, I love you all and I'll see you in the next one.